being all into Jesus right here. Which, listen, many people are all into Jesus being Savior. But you have to cross over to him being Lord. Many people want heaven, not hell, but they haven't graduated from the point where they go, I'm going to be obedient on earth. It shouldn't be hard if he's Lord. It should be easy if you appreciate salvation. And so th today, I want you to put your hands together for my friend, Dennis Gallagher. Would you give him a hand clap today as he comes forward to minister? Come on up, Pastor Dennis. Well, I guess you can be seated. Uh, okay, now do the power is here. Give me a favor, everybody. Everybody, smile at me real quick here. Am I, do I have this wrong here? That's a little bit better. There we go. Everybody, smile at me because you might not be. Smi Some of you are not. I see you're holding back. You know. I need you to, you might not be smiling at the end of this, so I need you to, I'm going to take a picture right here. Well, it is a, it is a great joy uh, to be with you. Uh, you know, I'll tell you something, it's always wonderful. Uh, we have had the privilege of, uh, of ministering throughout the United States and, and throughout the world, and it's always uh, a great privilege to be in the body of Christ. But what's even better is to go anywhere in the world and feel like you fit. You know what I mean? To know people who are there, to have relationships that are already established, and even coming in here this morning, being able to say hello by name to a number of people, and the number of you that I've met here this morning, it's just a great joy to be in the body of Christ. You know, and, and in, the, in the church, as well as in the family, we celebrate birthdays together. I understand that yesterday during the, during the men's meeting, uh, it was announced that Billy Graham had turned 97 years old just this past week. You talk, about a, you talk about not just a spokesman for the Lord, but you talk about a prophet, a prophet. There was a great book, a, auto, a biography that was written about Billy Graham a, a number of years ago now. It's been over 20 years, but the name of the book was A Prophet with Honor. And what a man of God, what a great man of God. Uh, over the years that he has been preaching, he has preached to over 250 million people. He has preached in 185 countries. And that does not include the millions and millions of people that he has spoken to uh, through social media, uh, through tapes, through movies, through radio, television, all of these different kinds of things. Billy Graham is an amazing, amazing per a person. One of the greatest revivals that he ever preached at was a revival that was in uh, London in 1954. And during that revival, an old preacher came up to him after the service. And he said to him, he said, Mr. Graham, I have come here every night, and every night I've heard a different sermon, but I've only heard one message. And that one message that Billy Graham has always preached, it is that there is a heaven that we are headed towards, and we need to know Jesus Christ if we're to go. In 1956, in the midst of the Cold War, Billy Graham penned a letter to America. He went out through all of the newspapers and then once again he took that letter in 2015 and he once again sent that out to the church in the United States. He said this, he said, those who shout the loudest about their faith may surrender the soonest in the coming persecution. Many who boast of being courageous will be cowardly. And then he offered five ways for faith to survive the coming trials. And how many people know here that we're in the midst of the beginning of persecution even in our own country? We have seen it in this past year. It has been demonstrated over and over to us. And we have seen what is going on in the church around us. And here's the... I think we're going to change microphones here. If we could... Graham offered five ways, or five ways for faith to survive. He offered these first in 1956 and then again this year. The first one was to make sure of your relationship with God. And he's speaking these things to the church. This is a time, he said, 
for repentance and for faith. It is a time for soul searching. It is a time to see if our anchor holds. Secondly, he said he urged Christians to walk with God daily. It's funny that we should have to encourage people to do this. We all know it, but he is encouraging the church right now in 2015, the church that you and I are a part of, the church that meets here at Powerhouse, the church that meets right now back in New Braunfels, Freedom Fellowship Church. And he said he, to walk daily with God. Third, he said reading the Bible and reading it deeply are essential activities. You know what? For many Christians today, the Bible is little more than a reference book for facts. It's little more than a reference book for, for biblical facts. It is seldom open and rarely re relished as the spiritual staff of life. And church, the church needs to return to reading the Bible as the spiritual staff of life. Not just to know something, not just to do a Bible study, but to read it as our food, our daily food. He also said that prayer is essential. This is something that you're going to be hearing more and more through the magazines, through the television, through the preaching of the word in 2016 is being declared as a year of prayer for the church throughout the United States. As individuals and as churches, we must repent of prayerlessness. We need to stop talking about it and we need to begin to do it. Graham wrote this, the prayer meeting must become the vital institution it was when evangelical Christianity was the mightiest force in the world. And finally, Graham, Graham's warnings conclude with a plea that Christians put their trust where it belongs. He wrote this, history and the Bible indicate that mechanical and material might are insufficient in times of great crisis. The wheels of God's judgment can be heard by discerning souls across the length and the breadth of the nations. Things are happening fast. The need for a return to God has never been more urgent. And if Billy Graham said it, guess what? I believe it. I believe it. Now, I've been watching the journey that Powerhouse has been on this year. I'm fortunate to have time with your pastor, talking about the things of the church, talking about the great issues that the church faces, and I understand that there has been a call to be all in. Is it still up there? It was up there before, attendance, service, and tithing. I want to add another one if I can. I want to extend tithing out to those of you who are here today, and you're tithing, and you've nailed that down. I call it above the cut giving, above the cut giving. Here are some facts about churches. 90% of churches in the United States today have 350 or less in their services on Sunday morning. That means that nine out of 10 churches in America have an average attendance of less than 350. The reason? Well, because most churches don't release authority and responsibility beyond the pastor's office. And when you find churches that are exceeding the norm, then you know that the structure is in place to sustain the vision, the purpose, the mission, and the people of the church. And before you jump up and shout, thank you. Before you jump up and shout, before you, too good, you feel too good about your church, because both of our churches are exceeding the norm. We're in the top 10% of churches in the United States. I'm going to let you in on the dirty little secret. Big churches have more people. They have more staff. They have more pastors. They have more money. They have more facilities. They have more property. But here's the dirty little secret. The one thing that the upper 10% does not have is greater commitment. And those three areas of attendance, of service, and of tithing, and above the cut giving are the things that they lack most in. Now I know that the pastors and the, and the staff and the, and the guests who you've had, such as myself, 
have probably worn you out this year over this topic. Well, guess what, church? We are ahead in the game. We're ahead in the game. The series is coming to a close. The end of the year is soon. And I understand you're going to be going on with this to June, but the end of the year is a big shift for every church. And over the next several weeks of the year, we need to seal the deal at Powerhouse and finish strong. Amen? And let's hope I do better today than the Mets in the ninth inning last Monday night. Oh my gosh, did you see that game? I think it would have been better if the Strohs were praying any day of the, of the week. So. so I want to talk to you this morning about the bigger picture. I want to talk to you about the looming landscape of awakening that is going to be taking place in the next decade in the United States of revival of end time persecution and the return of Jesus Christ that is soon upon us. So I want us to begin by just praying. And I'm going to pray right out of the scriptures. I love the scriptures. I love the scriptures. And there's a beautiful prayer that Paul prayed for the Ephesians church in the book of Ephesians. And I want us to just pray a part of that. And so I'm going to pray but I want you to do more than just give your amen. I want you to let this settle in your heart. I want it to be your prayer today. It's my prayer. So let's pray it together. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, I ask you to come. And as the great apostle prayed, Lord, would you open the eyes of our understanding that we might know the hope, the hope that you have, Lord God, in your gospel, the hope that you have, Lord God, in us, and the hope that we should have in the calling that you have given to us. So Holy Spirit, I ask you to open our eyes today. Let us see not just the truth that's in your word, but let us see you. Let us see you and the way that you desire to change us and the way that you desire to transform your church. And I ask it all today, in the name of Jesus, amen. I want you to turn to the book of Numbers with me, the book of Numbers. For those of you who might not be as familiar with the Bible, might be new to the things of the Lord, that can always be a frustration. You should always have a sword with you, by the way. I'm doctrinally opposed to iPads in church, cell phones in church. Carry a sword with you. You need it. The book of Numbers is all the way back in the Old Testament. Start back in Genesis and go a couple of books forward and you'll find the book of Numbers. It's filled with incredible stories about how the children of Israel were coming through the wilderness on their way to the promised land. The history of this period of time is fascinating. For 40 years, the children of Israel, as you know, wandered. They wandered and they're wandering finally brought Israel to the broken edge of the Jordan River. Moses was soon to die, and Joshua was to assume the mantle of leadership. But before them, the promised land lay before them. And God took Moses up on a high mountain, and he said, Moses, I want you to see the promised land. Because of what you did, you can't enter in, but I want you to be able to see it. It was for the children of Israel the fulfillment of destiny. It was the miracles of the desert being exchanged for the promises of God fulfilled. Soon the Ark of the Covenant, the very presence of God, was to lead the way. The priest would pick up that great Ark of the Covenant and the people were to follow almost a mile behind them. It would be the time of the harvest season when they came to the River Jordan, and the Jordan River would have been swollen to three quarters of a mile across, overflowing its banks on both sides. But God would move, and the waters would stop. They would stand up in a heap, the Bible says. Now this was the second crossing that the children of Israel had made. The first was the Red Sea when they came out of Egypt. That first crossing was a type of leaving the world, leaving Egypt, and all of its idols and all of its lusts behind. Clearly, 
that first crossing out of Egypt through the Red Sea was a picture of conversion. The second crossing was to be the Jordan. Forty years had gone by, forty years that were not necessary except that the people had no faith. And now all of the faithless had died and the children of Israel that were left were ready to cross over into the Jordan. And this second crossing represented the dying to self, not just conversion, but the dying to self which represents going on in the fullness of their calling. Does that sound anything like all in? The Jordan was the all in of the children of Israel. The miracles of the wilderness would stop. They would have to feed themselves instead of going out and picking up manna. Their shoes would wear out, their clothes would wear out, and though all of the blessings were before them, all of the wilderness miracles would end. On the west side of the Jordan, when they crossed over, there would be a whole group of people, a whole bunch of enemies that they were called to conquer. You've heard these names before. They were the Canaanites, also known as the Lowlanders. As they crossed over the Jordan, it would be the first group of people that they would have to conquer. The Jebusites, holding the fortress of Jerusalem just up the road from Jericho. There were the Hittites, who held Hebron, and the Amorites, who were the Highlanders, the Hivites, who centered themselves around Gibeon, who centered themselves at the feet of Mount Hermon. The, her, the, the mountain that you have heard so much about in the Old Testament. There was the Perizzites who took the high plains of Mount Carmel and in the extreme north there was a powerful chief by the name of Jabin and he was simply known as the wise one. But we're way ahead of ourselves. Before the conquest, before the walls of Jericho were to come tumbling down, before the memorial stones were plucked out of the Jordan River and taken and made into a memorial heap that would remind the children of Israel of the great miracle of the parting of the Jordan and the people coming across, before the waters stood up in a heap, before the priest's toes touched the Jordan, for Moses died and God himself buried him where no one would find his grave. There was to be no memorial. It was all in for God. The Bible tells a story about the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and half of the tribe of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. And it tells us that story and Numbers chapter 32, beginning with verse 1. Now the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad had an exceedingly large number of livestock. So when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, that it was indeed a place suitable for livestock. The sons of Gad and the sons of Reuben came and spoke to Moses and to Eleazar the priest, and to the leaders of the congregation, saying, The land which the Lord conquered before the congregation of Israel is a land for livestock. And your servants, guess what? We've got livestock. You see, they were on the wrong side of the Jordan. God was about to take them the distance to do what the children of Israel had waited over 400 years for, real deliverance, not just from Egypt, but from the wilderness, from the idols, from all of the sin, and bring them into the promised land. And these three tribes, Reuben, Gad, and this half-tribe of Manasseh that's, that's mentioned later on, the Bible says that they saw the land. They saw the land. They saw what was in the immediate they lacked the spiritual eyes where they could see that the promise of God was so much better than what they had right now. They saw that it was suitable. It was good enough. It was second best. And then they said to Moses, 
And those three words, saw and suitable and said, follow in a direct line. Because when you can't see the promises of God, when you can see the promises of God and you don't want the promises of God, when you want second best and when second best is good enough, then you will begin to speak with your mouth against the very blessings that God wants to bring into your life. You see, their plan was based on the flesh. They based their desire to settle for what was easy. Moses, Moses, have you seen these wonderful fields that are out here? Have you seen how the cattle can all come down right to the Jordan and they can drink right here? Have you noticed that we've already conquered everything on this side of the Jordan? I'll tell you what we're going to do. I'll tell you what we're going to do, Moses. We are going to give up our inheritance to our brothers, and we'll stay here. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? You see, the way that they saw it was that they were all about blessing their brothers. In fact, they forfeited their inheritance to the West in order to claim second best in the wilderness. Their names exposed their character. There was Reuben. Reuben. Reuben means a son who sees. A son who sees. He was Jacob's firstborn. And he lost his birthright because he was driven by lust. And Reuben looked out and he always saw what he wanted. He was motivated he was motivated by lusts, by possessions, by titles, by pleasures of this world. He was motivated by all of those things. You see, now he was part of the family, remember? He was part of the family. He was part of everything that was going on. He obviously had a good enough relationship with Moses to walk right up to his tent and said, Sorry, Uncle Moses, can we have a word with you? But his name. A son who sees. His own father, in Genesis 49, verse 4, his own father said this about him. He is unstable as water. You shall not excel. Wow. There was Gad. There was Gad. A Gad means, means a fortune or troop. It's another word for mercenary. Another word for mercenary. He was out for himself. He was a hired gun. He was loyal only to self. Moses said this about Gad. He provides the first part for himself. Isn't that interesting? Outwardly obedient, but inwardly consumed with meeting his own need first. I'll commit, he would say. I'll commit, but first... Let me make sure that I'm set. Let me make sure that I'm secure. Then, then I can do so much more for the Lord. Uh, and, and then there was, there was Manasseh. Manasseh was the son of Joseph. The tribe of Joseph was split into two halves. There was two sons. They were the half tribe. One of them was the, was the tribe of Manasseh. The other one was a different tribe. So he had half of an inheritance. His name means to forget, to neglect. And he lived up to his name. You see, he forgot the ways of his father. You remember Joseph? Joseph, a visionary. Joseph, a man who always saw the cup half full. Joseph, a man with a direction. Joseph, a man with a plan. Joseph, who never heard on, held on to bitterness. Joseph, who became a great, great man of God in his own right, in heathen Egypt. And yet Manasseh forgot the ways of his father. He neglected the commandment of the Lord. And he finds himself here in front of Moses saying, Moses, I'll take second best. You see, these are the traits of the half-hearted. These are the traits of the half-hearted. David Wilkerson has a great name for him. He calls them the, the middle grounders. The middle grounders. Unstable as water, hot or cold, and usually lukewarm, swift or stagnant, a flood or a drought, 
never excelling, but calculated and cautious, lest they lose something precious. Carrying a Bible, oh, you can sing along to all of the tunes on K-Love, but neglecting the Word, neglecting the relationship with Jesus, neglecting the relationship with the one who is my Lord, who I am a slave to. Trusting their own choices instead of God, forgetting the blessings and the promises, unwilling to let go of idols that are still in the closet, not willing to leave the middle ground behind in order to press on into the great things, the promises of God. Do you, you want me to turn to a different part of the Bible here? You, y'all are looking pretty serious out there. <laughs> but the real tragedy of the, heart, of the half-hearted was what Moses knew. Look in verse 7 of Numbers 32. It says this, Why are you discouraging the sons of Israel from crossing over into the land which the Lord had given you. Can you imagine their response? We're not discouraging anybody. Are you kidding? We're giving them our inheritance. When people continue on in half-heartedness, when people determine that they're going to settle for second best, even in their heart, it is discouraging to the body of Christ. It's discouraging to those who are ready to go into the promise. Half-heartedness drains the life from a team. Half-heartedness discourages great faith in God. Half-heartedness destines others to a wilderness of disappointments and half-baked dreams. See, this is, this is bigger than a church. I'm not speaking to a church today. I am speaking prophetically to the church. This is the church that we have in the United States today. This is the struggle that we are facing. This has always been the thing that has held the church back, no matter in what country, no matter in what age, no matter in what dispensation, if you like that term, no matter what, it is half-heartedness that holds the church back from taking on the great, great promises of God and seeing us be able to press on all the way into the promised land that God has given to us. This is bigger than a church, even a successful top ten church. This is about the body of Christ. This is about the end time church. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 says, You shall love the Lord with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. Then Jesus comes to Luke 10, 27. In Luke 10, 27, and Jesus repeats it when the lawyer comes to him and says, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus says, well, that's easy. Love the Lord, heart, soul, and might. And then in Matthew 22, Jesus comes back And he says that this is the greatest commandment. It is the foremost commandment. You know what's being described here? The greatest commandment, the greatest commandment is to be all in. The greatest commandment means that if I'm all in with Jesus, if I'm obeying him, if I'm really committed, body, soul, and spirit, then man, I will make an awesome church member. Amen, GF? I'm telling you, this is not about powerhouse church having a congregation that's all in or Freedom Fellowship having a church that's all in. This is about churches like ours being all in so that we can lead the way to the greatest end time revival that the church has ever needed. Church America needs a great awakening. Who is going to lead it? Is it going to be Gad? Is it going to be Manasseh? Is it going to be the half-hearted? Is it going to be Reuben? Or is it going to be places like here and in New Braunfels and scattered throughout this land that are saying we're going the distance, we're claiming the promises, we want God to move, and we are all in.
Yet the most damning words, and yes, I just said damn in church, the most damning words of all of the Bible, of all of the New Testament, are found in the very last book of the New Testament. Jesus comes, the resurrected Christ, and he first comes to the church that he loved and honored more than any other, the church at Ephesus. And he says, you've left your first love. And then he comes to the church at Laodicea. And he says, you're neither hot nor cold, you're lukewarm. You say, I'm rich, I'm wealthy, I have need of nothing. But Jesus comes and he says, are you kidding me? You are wretched. You are miserable. You are poor, blind, naked. What's the lesson? Church, the lesson is... When we are half-hearted, when we are half-hearted, we instantly become the church that Jesus came to and said, watch out. Beware of half-heartedness. Every preacher needs to beware of half-heartedness. Every time we get up to speak, we need to be careful that we're not going on old manna. Every time we say something to someone, we need to be careful that our heart is clear of the lukewarm waters. Billy Graham said it best, this is a season for repentance and for faith. To walk with God daily, to read the book as if it is more than facts, but it is the staff of life to repent of prayerlessness and to recognize the need to return to God. For the church, for the church, it has never been a more urgent hour. It was not the enemies on the west side of the Jordan that were first conquered. What first needed to be conquered was the compromised and lukewarm hearts on the east side of the Jordan. The reason we have a powerless church, a church that is more influenced by the world than salt and light to the world is because we have compromised, we have settled for the middle ground. Remember, salvation is the leaving behind of the idolatry and the sin of the old life. That is conversion, but to be all in, to be all in is not just about showing up. It's not just about serving and giving. Because the problem with those hearts is that they, if they are not consecrated, if they are not set apart, if they are not all in with Jesus, then they'll soon slip back to where they were. We could have our worship leaders come at this time. Luke 14, verse 26. Luke chapter 14. If anyone comes to me and <clears throat> does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he can't be my disciple. Listen to this. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You've probably heard this before. But when people in Jerusalem were standing there watching a guy carry a cross out of Jerusalem, they didn't know much about him. They didn't know if he was rich or poor. They didn't know whether he had stolen something or murdered somebody or had just got on the wrong side of Pilate. They didn't know if he had a family or if he was destitute. They didn't know anything about him, but they did know this. He was not coming back. And Jesus said that there's a cross. And that cross is consecration, friend. It's saying I'm all in and I'm, I'm not going back. But then later on in the same passage, Jesus says this in verse 33. So then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. I like it in the New King James. It says, he does not forsake all that he has 
Forsake means to renounce, to surrender, claim to, to give up, to say goodbye to. Adios. Bye-bye. That's what it means. And in every one of our hearts, every one of our hearts, there's those places that I would just like to keep my own. To be all in. Oh, it's so far beyond. What a great place to start. Attendance. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Just don't disobey that commandment. Service. We are born again to serve. We're born again to serve. Tithing. The first step towards freedom, real freedom, is to give God what belongs to Him. None of you can be my disciples who doesn't give up forsake all that he has. The time is late. But how about you today? Reuben's heart was divided. Men, is it divided in your marriage today? Is it divided in your marriage? Is there something that has come between you and the one that God gave you. It's a divided heart. Is it work? Is it some look that you've got that nobody knows or you don't think anybody knows that you give to someone else? Ladies, what is it in your what have you taken back from the Lord? Are you afraid? Afraid of what the future will look like? Afraid of what is going to happen with the kids? Give it to God. You'll never go on in the promises of God if you're half-hearted. Reuben's heart was divided. Gad was out to take care of himself first. Manasseh forgot the blessing and neglected God. And today, the Holy Spirit is calling you across this Jordan. Whatever that Jordan looks like in your life, today, today, you need to come across. Will you come? Would you stay with me? Just bow your heads and let's pray together. Holy Spirit, I ask you to come now. Come in a marvelous, marvelous demonstration of your grace and your mercy. Come, Holy Spirit, and show us your is that you today with your head bowed and your eyes just on Jesus would you allow the Holy Spirit to do what only the Holy Spirit can do there's a great great prayer in the book of Psalms it says Lord see if there be any wicked way within me and lead me in your everlasting way do you know what that means that means that God's not here put his finger on your life and expose you. He's here to put his finger on your life so that he can bring everlasting life to that part of your heart that's divided right now. In just a moment, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to come. I don't want you to miss this time. This is a point of what I call an everlasting decision. You will carry this decision into eternity if you make it today. Don't allow half-heartedness. Don't allow a lie of fear to keep you from coming and saying, Lord, today it belongs to you. Today it's all on the altar. Today I give you all of my possessions, all of this that I'm holding on to. And Holy Spirit, I ask you to come and to speak a powerful word to hearts today. In Jesus' name, as we worship the Lord, you come, fill these altars. Don't hold back. Come and commit these things to Jesus today. What is it that would keep you back from the things of God today? You come and receive from the Lord. Prayer teams, if you would come also at this time. Let's worship the Lord together.
amazing place. Just get out of your chairs and come. Come on. Let's just use it as a time between you and God. And let's get right. Father, we pray today that you would remove all half-heartedness out of us. That we wouldn't be lukewarm, qualifying to be spewed out. We, we, we're all in. Give us an all-in heart. Come, church, come. Come to the altar and just pray. This is your altar, and you need to get used to it. The altar is a place where things are burned up, where you come in and you just lay something down, and you allow God to take it today. Why not receive that from the Lord today? This is your altar. You can come and pray, kneel, stand, whatever you want to do. It's your altar. you've been away from the Lord, just come and, and repent. That's, it's not a cuss word. That's, that's something he gave you. Just repent. Say, I'm sorry. I, I repent of the things I've thought, the things I've said, the things I've done. And I need to be forgiven. You know, if you're here today and you've never made that first crossing, never come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I give up. See, becoming a Christian is simply saying, God, you know I'm wrong and I know I'm wrong. And I'm coming to tell you right now, I need you. That's what it is. And if you're here this morning and you've never made that step, I don't care how long you've been coming to this church or some other church, I don't care how many times you've walked down an aisle, if you've not committed your life to Jesus, I just want you to raise your hand. I want you to come down here. And I just want you to raise your hand because there's prayer teams down here who can lead you in a prayer of accepting Jesus Christ, of nailing that one down. Don't leave here today without knowing Jesus Christ, consecrating your life to Him, coming out of Egypt, out of the idols. You come and just let one of the prayer team know so that they can pray with you. Stretch your hands out towards everyone who's come down. You're the body of Christ. Let's, let's do what we were created to do today. Can we work together on this? Open your mouth and begin to pray that God would meet every woman, every man's need that's come. This is a life-changing moment, just like it was when you have returned to the Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. You can just pray right where you are. Thank you, Lord Jesus for receiving me and removing the sin from my life, cleansing me as white as snow. I plead the blood of Jesus upon your life today. You are a new creation. Old things passed away. All things have become new. And today is the first day of the rest of your life on earth and in eternity. Don't ever allow yourself to go backwards. Don't be half-hearted. Press in, press in, press in were bought at a great price. Press in, press in, press in, press in, press in, in. Jesus' name, press in, press in, press in. He said, I've removed your sin from you as far as the east is from the west. I will remember it no more. The grace of God the grace of God, the mercy of God. I will remember it no more. He didn't come to play games. He came to forgive sin. He loves you and desires that you're with him. That's the only way to get you and me there is to remove sin. Woo. How he loves me. He's amazing. He's amazing. He's amazing, church. Hallelujah. I believe this is the way church services should climax with people being saved, don't you? People being changed. People being uh, given hope. So what we're going to do is, is this morning, we're just going to pray and, and we're going to dismiss quietly, but we want you to stay here. If you're up at the altar and you need prayer, just stay. This is what we came to do. Pastor Dennis, I want to present to you and Jan an all-in shirt today. Give him a hand clap today. Come on.
What a great message. Thank you so much. That one's for Miss Jan right there. Because how many know the two are one? This, this couple, I'll tell you, have been faithful. They have been preaching the gospel and uh, have come under, just like all of us, a lot of attacks. And we want you to know your, 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 your time is seen by the Lord. And I thank God for you. What a great message today. Let's give the Lord a hand clap for that. I received today, brother. Thank you so much. That was a God thing. Praise the Lord. I want to pray quickly for Miss Valerie uh, Burton. She called in this morning. Uh, never a more faithful lady that have I met. And she just asked if we would pray that she's in some pain this morning. And... Uh, also, you know, if, if you're going, if you're undergoing some things right now and you're in pain or you're, you have some things going on, maybe you have a doctor's visit. I know that uh, the Manzanos have some, some needs in that area. You know, I don't think we should be ashamed to pray for one another. That's, this is a family, yes? And when you're all in, I think that, that, that when we pray for one another, the Bible says he'll heal us. And so I just, I just want us to lift up Miss Jacinia today and Valerie and anybody else that needs to be lifted up, just raise your hand up. We won't have to call your name, but oh my, lots of people, lots of hands going up. If you Just raise your hand if you need healing in your body or you know somebody that does. Now reach over and touch that person on the, on the shoulder and let's just get an agreement. Father, in Jesus' name, today you said that if we tithe and offer, you would rebuke the devourer, God, today. Today, we need you to rebuke the enemy from our bodies. Rebuke him from our finances, our bodies, and take pain all away from the men and women of God. Take pain away, God, today. I thank you, Father, that you can rebuke cancer. You're willing and able. I stand in the gap today and say, cancer, go in Jesus' name. Father, today, I say, pain, go in Jesus' name. I plead the blood of Jesus over every member here that is being attacked in their body. Why? Because we have the right to do it. You bought that for us, Father. So today we pray for Jacinia. We pray for those that are going in, uh, in, to, 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 to the hospital or somebody who's in the hospital today. Father, you know what they need. And we pray right now that you would remove all sickness and disease from the midst of us. We love you, Father, and we claim it as our right in Christ. And today begins that new day, as Pastor Dennis was talking about. A new day for people who are all in and all committed. And I pray that you would hear our prayers and begin to validate it with signs following. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.